Hey, good morning, Milton Bible Church. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning. Welcome to each and every one of you that have chosen to be here with us. My name is Matt Timpson. I'm one of the leaders at Milton Bible Church. We would love to have an opportunity to connect with you. Um, go to mbc.life, mbc.life, and there's lots of ways to connect. There's a prayer card where you can leave prayer requests. There's um, activities for children to do. There's ways to give. And there is a connect card there so you can fill in your information. We would love to be in touch with you. We're also really looking forward to being together in person on August 9th, as many of you now know. We're really, really looking forward to that. It's been wonderful to have our online services, to be able to connect with a wider audience than maybe we, maybe we normally do. Lots of friends and family of Milton Bible Church have been joining us, and that's been wonderful. When we get together on August 9th, there's two things that are key in our minds. Number one is safety. We want to provide a safe, clean environment with the proper, proper social distancing so that we can come be together as the body of Christ, but also be wise in the way that we are protecting each other. We have our staff, our elders, our ministry leaders are working on all the necessary arrangements to make sure that when we're back together, It'll be a great time together, but it will be safe. Number two is that we want to be able to continue to provide online services. That's very important to be able to continue this so that if you're unable to join us, if you're maybe, um, if you have some health concerns and reasons why you don't want to come, or if you would just be more comfortable waiting a little while, that's all perfectly fine. We love you. We bless you in that decision. And we want to offer you online uh, an online opportunity to continue to watch and worship with us. So we look forward to that on August 9th. This morning, let's just turn our hearts to God. We are gathered together um, in one mind, in one body. Even though the body is not together, we are here all together worshiping God. Let's just pray this morning. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to worship together as the body of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we have an opportunity to get back together in person on August 9th. But Lord, we also know that we are still together in one spirit, in one mind, even when we are not together. Um, so Lord, this morning we worship you together. We worship you in spirit. We worship you out of the love in our hearts that we have for you, God. We ask that you would pour out your spirit on each one of us, each individual, each household, excuse me, each household that is tuning in this morning, I just pray that you would pour out your spirit on each and every one of them. In your name we pray, amen. the King of glory and light, all praises to the only giver of life, our maker, the gates are open wide, we worship you, come see what love has done, amazing, he bought us with his blood, a savior, the cross is overcome. We worship you. We shout, Hosanna, Jesus, he saves. We shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave. Come and lift him up, Hosanna. Now let the lost be found. Death could not hold him down. He's risen. So let the saints cry out. We worship you. We shout, Hosanna. Jesus, he saves. We shout, Hosanna. He rose from the grave. Come and lift him up. Hosanna. We shout, Hosanna. Jesus, he saves, we shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave, come and lift him up, Hosanna. The 
same power that rolled the stone away. The same power alive in us today. King Jesus, we call upon your name. No other name. The same power that rolled the stone away. The same power alive in us today. Call upon your name, no other name. We shout, Hosanna, Jesus, he saves. We shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave. Come and lift him up, Hosanna. We shout, Hosanna, Jesus, he saves. We shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave. Come and lift him up, Hosanna. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we give you all our praise and glory and honor this morning. We lift up high the name of Jesus wherever we are, and we unite together and our worship and love of you. We ask that you pour out your spirit on us, that we might rightly uh, reflect your love to uh, the world around us. God, we ask this in your name for your glory. Amen. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can say, will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I Shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my faithful you are faithful 
Welcome once again to Milton Bible Church Online. It is great to be together. I can hardly wait, four weeks time from now, we are going to be meeting once again at the Connect Center, and it's gonna be great to see as many folks as possible that are gonna come out. We're also gonna continue, as Matt said, to maintain our online church experience for those who cannot uh, make it out. We want you to understand that as a church family, we wanna include as many people as possible and uh, make sure that the format for worship and word uh, includes everyone. Because we understand that not everyone is gonna be able to come out and experience uh, live worship and uh, uh, ministry uh, on a Sunday at first. There are gonna be reasons for health reasons or other reasons or maybe even simply not feeling comfortable yet. And there's gonna be lots of grace for that. We understand that. We're a family together. We're gonna to be together on it, support one another in it, and uh, soon things will be all back to normal. All things will be as it should. And we will continue to deal with the realities that God gives us as we take this journey together. Well, this morning, we wanna continue our studies in the book of Revelation. We're gonna look at the letter to the Church of Pergamum in Revelation chapter two. And I don't know if you know what the word etymology means, but it means the study of words. Etymology means the study of words. I love words. And this week I kind of looked up some weird words in the Oxford English Dictionary. English language is one of the weirdest languages on earth. And the Oxford English Dictionary seeks to capture the English language. So here are some interesting words that I learned this week. One of those words is the word collywobble. Collywobble, or collywobbles. And what, it refers to a weird feeling in your stomach or over an overall bellyache. And it comes from the words cholera morbus and it refers to the disease of cholera that uh, has, breaks out once in a while in the world and has uh, you know, infiltrated a, a number of places. But it simply means to have an upset stomach. I have the collywobbles. Another interesting word that I learned this week was the word bumfuzzle. Bumfuzzle, can you say bumfuzzle? This is a simple term that refers to being, com being confused perplexed, out of sorts, you know, when you're kind of lost and you're scratching your head and you don't know what's going on, you are bumfuzzled. So on occasion, that may happen to you. One thing that happens to me on a regular basis is uh, this, it's called a, bibli a bibliophobia, a bibliophobia. And a, bibliopho a bibliophobia is the fear of not having something good to read. And I have this on a regular basis where I'm running out of good reading material and I just don't find, you know, that which what I'm looking for. And as I get towards the end of a good book, I have a, bibli a bibliophobia, the fear of not having something to read. All of these words captured in the Oxford English Dictionary. I don't know if you knew, but at the end of every year, and at the end of every calendar year, the Oxford English Dictionary chooses a word of the year. And in 2016, it chose the word post-truth. Post-truth. Let me tell you what, how they define it. The Oxford English Dictionary defines post-truth. It's an adjective defined as relating to or denoting circumstances 
in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. You see, we've come into an era which can be defined as an era that rejects objective truth and instead people believe what they believe not because of facts but because of feelings or because of deep held desires. And that's why fake news and fact checking seems to make no difference in public opinion. Someone can make a speech and they can say, oh, this person made 17 mistakes or errors or false you know, uh, uh, things in their speech and uh, simply things that aren't true and those facts are checked on and they're reported and it doesn't seem to change opinion polls at all. Why? Because we live in a post-truth era where what I feel to be true actually makes it true more than what the facts are about the truth. That is the era in which we live. And in 2016, the Oxford English Dictionary said, we are now living in a post-truth era. Therefore, our word of the year is post-truth. Now, <clears throat> to live in a post-truth culture means to make decisions purely based on personal preference, preference deeply held desires, emotions, regardless of the facts or the future outcome. And the enemy in this type of culture is the one who stands up and says, but no, these are the facts, and this is truth. A truth that transcends personal preference or deeply held desires. Let me ask you a question. Does anyone actually believe in truth anymore? Does anyone actually believe in truth anymore? Well, if Christians, we believe that truth has a name. And his name is Jesus. We believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, and to declare that Jesus is Lord, is to say that I am not Lord. Whenever anyone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, they bend the knee to Christ. They profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that he died on the cross and he bore my sin, your sin, and through his death on the cross, through his burial, through his resurrection and ascension, and through believing in that and receiving that as our truth, something that we embrace, something that we hold dear and have faith in, through that faith we are saved. And so Jesus isn't merely our savior, you see, when we receive Christ, we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he becomes our king. He becomes our savior and our Lord. And his writing, that which is taught in the Holy Scriptures, becomes our authority for faith and practice. We say the teachings of Jesus, as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, infallible, inerrant, without fault, or, or, or blemish or inconsistency, we believe that has authority for our lives because we believe that this is irrevocable truth that transcends all else. And when you begin to make those kinds of statements in a post-truth era, things begin to happen. Things begin to happen. As Christians, we believe that the Word of God, the Bible, has authority for our lives. So how do you live in a post-truth culture, in a post-truth world? Well, theologians are discussing this right now, and they are putting different propositions forward. One of those propositions that has been put forward is a new monasticism. Literally, one camp has begun to write on a new monasticism for our modern day. So in other words, what we want to do is we want to take the truth of the gospel, we want to run out into the desert like the old monastic fathers did, we want to preserve the truth of the gospel, we want to protect it, and one day when culture is ready again for truth, we'll bring it back. That's one possibility, that's one camp. The second camp that's out there is the camp that says, hey, let's take the truth of the Bible and let's assimilate it with the truth of our culture. Let's 
kind of meld these two together and let's kind of pick a way that one doesn't seem to offend the other and let's try and live with both of these things kind of mixed together. Well, do you know what? Those are two camps that are really prominent in intellectual Christian writings right now. But let me tell you, I think there's a third way, and that third way is written to the church in Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2. It's a third way. Let me just say this. Before we get into this letter, let me just say this one thing, and that is this. This is a tough message. This is a difficult sermon to preach and to hear. So let me say this up front. I love you. I love you, and I will only say things for your good and for God's glory in your lives, in the life of the church, being obedient to the teachings of scripture, but going forward and speaking hard truth. It's very interesting. Ephesus, we looked at that week number one. Ephesus was a loveless church. Uh, the, The warning to Ephesus, the church in Ephesus was, you have lost your first love. Last week, we looked at the letter to the church in Smyrna, and this was a persecuted church, a difficult place to be. Pergamum is a compromised church. It's a church that has compromised its belief. Let me tell you a little bit about the city of Pergamum. Pergamum is a city that's known for two things. First of all, it's known for its intellectuality. It is, uh, in fact, the word uh, perga, where we get pergamum, pergama means parchment or paper. It is a place of learning. It is a place that was well known for its libraries, universities, and scholars. In fact, one library in Pergamum had 200,000 volumes, an incredible, uh, vast array uh, collection of writing. The second thing Pergamum was known for was its sexuality, its sexuality. You see, it was the center of Caesar worship, which incorporated temple prostitution. And Caesar worship demanded, as we looked at last week, that one time per year, each and every uh, person who was in the, in the city had to come to the temple of Caesar and had to bow down and, and worship Caesar, say that he is my God and he is my king, he is my spiritual authority, he is my earthly authority. And if someone did not do that, there was a price to be paid, a high price to be paid. In fact, in Smyrna, we looked at last week, Polycarp, the pastor of the church, refused to do that very thing, and he was killed for not worshiping Caesar. So this is a very big deal. A lot of pressure on the church. Well, we want to get into this letter to the church of Pergamum, so let me read it. To the church in Pergamum, it says, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to open it, read it along with me. Verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and to practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no, that no one knows except the one who receives it. 
And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, the big idea in this letter to the church of Pergamum is this. Hold tight to the truth of Jesus. Hold tight to the truth of Jesus, who he is and what he teaches. Now in verse 12, Jesus introduces himself. He says, John, write this down. This is how I want to be presented to the church in Pergamum. And he says this. He says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, that's the picture of Jesus. The the sharp two-edged sword is the sword of judgment. It is the sword of warning. It is the sword of war. And that's who he says, I want this church to have a picture of when they read this letter. So different from the letters to Ephesus and Smyrna. In Ephesus, it says the word, the introduction was the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The golden lampstands represent the church. And he says, listen, I'm the one who stands in the midst of the churches. I am with you. I am for you. I am in this. Everything that you're going through, I know about. And I walk with you in it. Phenomenally reassuring. Then in Smyrna, the picture of Jesus is the word is this: the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. This was a church undergoing great, great persecution, and Jesus is saying, "I want you to understand, I'm the one who died and came to life. The power of the resurrection is with you. The power of the resurrection by the Spirit of God is is dwelling amongst you, and that's who I am, and I am with you. You can do this. We can do this together. There is a brilliant promise waiting for those who are faithful. Fabulous. Not the same picture as the church to Pergamum. More of a warning. Get this right, or there's trouble. It's the image from Revelation 1.16 where there's a picture of God himself and it says, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. In other words, Jesus is ready to wage war against the church because of the compromise that they have to the teachings of the word of God. Let me ask you a question. How many doors do you think Jesus is standing outside of with a sword in his hand in our day? who've compromised the teaching of the Holy Scriptures, who do not teach the whole counsel of God, who have abandoned the concepts of sin and salvation, and who do not speak the word of God with boldness. I wonder how many doors Jesus is standing outside of right now. Well, there are three statements that Jesus makes. We're gonna go through these. and consider each one of them carefully. Jesus makes three statements to this church in Pergamum, and the very first statement that he makes is that he commends them for standing strong in adversity. He commends them for standing strong in adversity, which is really cool. Verse 13, he says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet You hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who is killed among you where Satan dwells. Now twice in this one verse, Jesus repeats this statement, Pergamum, where Satan dwells. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, Satan has a number of franchises all over the country. He's got them in towns, he's got them in villages, but let me tell you where head office is for Satan. Head office is in Pergamum. HQ is in Pergamum. That is the center of Satan's activity and his advance against the church. That is where Satan lives. You know, sometimes you have heard of certain communities where there's uh, quite a bit of demonic activity, and I've heard of that, where there's a large satanic uh, coven or, or, or host or group of people, there's th- things, irrespicable, uh, unspeakable evil that occurs, you know, in, in those places, and, um, and in that, you know, you hear of those things, but I have never heard this is where Satan lives. This is where Satan's headquarters are. 
I've heard of rumblings of certain communities that have demonic activity, but I've never heard of a statement this clear and this profound. And that's what Jesus does. And it's really quite remarkable. Well, what does he mean by that? It means that Satan wars against those who will not submit to the values of a post-truth culture. Those who believe in absolute truth in Jesus will become the target of persecution. That's what Jesus is saying. That those who believe that there is an absolute truth, living truth, in Jesus Christ, the living word of God, they will become the objects of target, uh, the targets of, of, of attack because they don't jive with the culture of a post-truth culture. Pergamum was a seat of Caesar worship. And for Antipas, who's mentioned in this verse, he became a martyr for living because he wanted to live for Jesus in a post-truth culture. So let me just say this. If you, hear of a, of a, if you hear of a gospel that does not include the cost of discipleship, it is deficient at best or a false gospel at worst. Because at times in our lives, if we seek to live and declare truth, there will be pushback and there will be persecution or there will be compromise. And that is where things are going in this church. So let me ask you a question. How are you doing for paying the price in a post-truth culture? How are you doing at paying the price in a post-truth culture? Let me give you an illustration. There's a guy by the name of Dan Kathy, and he is the owner of all the Chick-fil-A restaurants in the United States of America. He's a committed Christian, loves the Bible, loves Jesus, and because of that, um, he does things like on Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, Chick-fil-A is not open. Sundays, Chick-fil-A is not open. He seeks to, to honor God in those things. And uh, in an interview, Dan, Kathy, and his wife were being interviewed, and they were asked by the interviewer, why do you think, you were so, why do you think that your restaurants are so successful? And you have to understand, Chick-fil-A in the United States is like Tim Hortons in Canada. I cannot imagine a Canada without Tim Hortons. I mean, I was there this morning. I cannot imagine uh, a Canada w without Tim Hortons. And you know what? Americans could not imagine America without Chick-fil-A. And they asked Dan Cathy, how, uh, how, what is your reason for your success? And you know what he said? He said, it is simply God's blessing. It is simply God's blessing. God has just sought to bless my family and to bless us with success in business. We try to do what's right and honest and good. And, uh, but ultimately, it really is all these things come from his hand. And then he went on to say that not only have we been blessed in business, but we've been blessed in our marriage. We've been blessed with many happy years of marriage, blessed in our children. And you know what? All of those things God has given to us. Well, after Dan Cathy said those things, a firestorm erupted across the United States. Well, he and his wife said nothing against anyone in any other kind of lifestyle because Dan Cathy said, we believe uh, in, in traditional marriage as taught by Jesus, you know, in the word of God, and because of that, we feel we're blessed. Well, a firestorm erupted across the U.S. Picketers began to pick the restaurants. Um, protesters began to uh, protest. P people uh, began to write all kinds of n nasty articles about them. Mayors of towns and cities began to say, we want Chick-fil-A out of our towns and out of our communities. Once again, let me say, I can't imagine Chick-fil-A not being in America. It would be so uh, incredible. I don't, I can't even imagine it. But do you know what? Because they simply said, we follow Jesus and we've been blessed by it, they paid a price. 
they paid a price for it. They weren't condescending or judgmental about anyone else in anyone else's lifestyle. They just said, they just were celebrating who they were in God and what they believed. And because of that, they paid a very large price for it. To speak truth is to speak against the spirit of our day. And there is a price to pay. But I want you to notice in verse 13, Jesus says the word my three times. He says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name. And you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, who was killed among you. He said, listen, the church, you belong to me. I love you. My, you are my servants, you hold truth, my faith, my gospel, and you are mine. And I wanna commend you for it, I wanna celebrate you for it. You have been faithful in the midst of terrible uh, persecution and terrible days. So the first thing he does is he commends the church. Second, Jesus challenges and condemns the unfaithful. In verses 14 to 16, it says this, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, we don't have time to go into it, but in Numbers chapter 22 to about 24, 25, we have the story of Balaam and Balak. Let me give you the Reader's Digest snapshot. The Reader's Digest snapshot is basically this. Balaam uh, and Balak. Balak was a Moabite king that lived alongside Israel in the Old Testament. What happened was Balak saw the prosperity of the people of Israel as they followed God, as the Spirit of God came upon the people, that they, they prospered and they were blessed and there was joy and celebration in the land. <clears throat> and Balak said, you know what? Spiritually, I see something's going on there. I want some of that. In fact, I want some of it and I don't want them to have it. So he went around to a false prophet, a guy who lived amongst them, a guy by the name of Balaam, who was supposed to have supernatural powers, and said, Balaam, I want you to go, and I want you to pronounce a curse on Israel. So Balaam, what he does, he gets up, he goes to, into Israel, and he goes to pronounce a curse on them. And he opens his mouth, and he goes to curse them, and what happens? Out of his mouth comes blessing. Out of his mouth comes blessing. Well, not only does that happen once, and twice. It happens three times. Three times Balaam goes and he seeks to pronounce cursing, but what actually happens, he pronounces blessing upon God's people. Goes back to Balak, says, Balak, guess what? Plan A didn't work. Uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try plan B. Here's plan B. I want you to get your young women and I want you to have them go into Israel I want you to have your young women seduce the young men of Israel, intermarry with them, weaken their faith in God, and, um, and, and take them away from, from the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. That was plan B, seduce the young men, and it worked. And that's exactly what did happen. So here's the lesson for Balak and Balaam, that some of you are holding to the teachings of Balaam that celebrate the mixture of the truths of the gospel and a post-truth culture. Somehow we think that holding the truths of the word of God and the word of the gospel, somehow we think that we can also hold and embrace the truth of a post-truth culture that keeps on shifting, that keeps on changing, and somehow we can intermarry these and live with them at peace. But the truth is, one will compromise the other. One will change the other. One will affect the other. And that is exactly what happened to the people of Israel. Compromise came in. Change came in. Their love for God changed. Their practice changed. And soon the blessing of God fell away. And that is what happened. You see, what we feel and what drives our desires 
when we sense that it is more important and has greater power in our lives than the absolute authority of God's word, we are in trouble. We are in trouble. And what Jesus does is he's saying, listen, church, this is happening all over the place. It's happening in your life. It's happening in your church. It's happening in your programs. It's happening, you know, in your families. And he said, it's time to repent. It's time to repent, to say, I am sorry, Lord, and I will change. I will change my mind. I'll change my direction. I will change the way I live. I will change the way I think. I will begin to be conformed by your word and your ways. So Lord, teach me, I repent, and I turn away from what I was doing, the compromise that I was embracing, and I turn towards you in all your glory and your love for my life. And that is what God was, was calling them to, to allow Jesus to be the Lord of our lives in every area, his personal in our personal preference and in our deeply held desires. So let me ask you something, is this a difficult thing to do? Do you know what I would say? Yes. Is it possible for us to do? Do you know what I would say? Absolutely, by the power of the Spirit of the living God, living within us, leaning into Jesus, leaning into his presence in our lives, and living fully for him. You see, Jesus, he wants to be the Lord over our entire lives. He wants to restore all of us to to a, a, a place of intimacy with him. That is what he's about. That is where he's going. And Jesus, he wants to restore us to that. Do you know, lately, and I, uh, lately, my wife and I have been doing some uh, renovations in our house. You know, we've done a little bit of work in that room, a little bit of paint in that room, a few flowers planted over there, and. Um, you know, you know, a little touch up here, a little touch up there. You know, our house is getting older, kind of needs some help. But what Jesus does is he says, listen, I'm not interested in touch ups. I'm not interested in a little renovation. I'll tell you what I'm interested in. You receive me as savior, you invite me in. You, you invite me to be Lord of your life and I'm gonna knock that house down and I'm gonna take a bulldozer and I'm gonna go over it and I'm gonna build you a brand new house with new rooms and, and, and a new place to gather, and new things to do, and I'm, gonna get, and I'm gonna make that house spectacular for you to live in and to live through. Jesus isn't just, you know, a, kind of a, a little, add, add a little makeup to our face, do a little touch-ups on the renovation, no. No, he wants a brand new thing, a brand new thing in us and through us. That is what he is after. That is the desire of his heart. Jesus desires to be Lord of our entire lives. You know, in John chapter 117, Jesus taught us that we need to hold a truth gracefully. And that's why he said, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Truth must always be spoken with grace. Truth must always be declared with love in mind, with only wanting people's best going forward. That is the only way truth should be spoken, but it needs to be spoken with grace. Well, we're gonna sum it up. The third thing that Jesus says as he speaks into the life of this church, he says, trust courageously in his victory. Trust courageously in his victory. He who has an ear, verse 17 says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Jesus says, I want you to understand, if you have an ear to hear what the Spirit, Holy Spirit is saying to you, church, this is what I'm gonna do for you. This is what we're gonna gonna do together. The first thing you're gonna do is uh, I'm gonna give you hidden manna. Now you have to understand, man, the word manna, it comes from the Old Testament where the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness 
And what happened was uh, they were hungry and Jesus provided manna, wafers of bread, and they would eat it fresh every morning and it would give them strength and it would sustain them. And what Jesus says, listen, if you live in this wilderness of post-truth culture and you desire to live for me, I will give you hidden manna that will strengthen you that will encourage you, that will sustain you for the journey through this wilderness that you are on. Phenomenal promise. The other thing he promises is a white stone with a new name. And he says, uh, a white stone with a new name. Uh, The scripture teaches that at salvation, Jesus gives us a new name. It's a name that only he has. It's a name that is revealed when we finish the race. And he gives us a white stone, and on it has our new name that he knows. And here's the deal. Jesus knows our name. He knows who we are. He knows what we are going through. He loves us. He names each one of us. And the fact of the reality is the promise of God, both in this life to sustain us and in the next life to celebrate and to be with him forever is a part, is something that will be received for all those who hold his truth dear to them and live fully for him. That's the promise. That's the encouragement. That's the path that we are called to be on. So let me just ask you in closing, what are the areas of your life that you feel you're compromising in? What are the areas of my life where I think, you know what, if I engage in this or if I see that or if I have a, I'm a part of this conversation or a part of this activity, I know it's going to get in the way of my relationship with God. I know it's going to get in the way of having that healthy, godly marriage and family that God has called me to. What are those things in which the world says, you know what, Truth is about what you feel, your emotions, and your deeply held desires. That is truth. God says, listen, my truth is held in my word, my living word, Jesus Christ. And he must always be first. And he must always be above all things. And yes, we will wrestle with these other things. We will wrestle with compromise, but let Christ be king. Let him be Lord. Let he, him be raised up as the king of glory in our lives, in our church. No compromise. Full blast, full on for him. That's the church that Christ calls us to be. And that is the church that we want to be fully alive in him. So in closing, I just want to pray for us. I want to pray because I fear that compromise is more in the church than we possibly realize. I also fear that perhaps there's someone listening that's never accepted Jesus as their Savior. And I believe God's desire for you today is to simply open your heart to him now and receive him as Lord and Savior and begin a new life in Christ. So let me pray. Father, I just wanna thank you for each person that's been patient enough to listen uh, through this talk. I thank you for the church in Pergamum and their desire to fight compromise in a post-truth culture. And so I just thank you for the fact that the scriptures uh, reveal that, you know what, there are times when we have issues and we have problems and we blow it and we make mistakes and we are not perfect, but we have a God of second chances, one who loves us and invites us in to the fullness of life with Jesus Christ at any time. And so I just pray for areas in our lives where we feel that if we engage, whether intellectually, whether um, 
you know, with media or with uh, w whether personally, you know, in, in social contexts, that we will be compromised and we will compromise the name of Jesus Christ. And I just pray against that. I pray that you would protect your people, that you would raise them up, that you would feed them hidden manna that would sustain them and strengthen them to be pure and holy before a righteous God. And I pray that should there be areas in our lives in which we need to repent, that we would do them right now and Spirit of God, you would bring them right up to our faces so that we can see exactly what it is you're talking to us about today. Renew your church, we ask. We're not looking for a renovation. We're looking for a complete rebuild, a rebuild in Jesus. And Father, I do want to pray for anyone who's never accepted Jesus as Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation, where they would simply bow their heads and say, I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me, that you rose again from the dead, you ascended into the heaven, and you now sit at the right hand of the Father, that you took my sin on the cross and gave me your righteousness so that I might be seen as righteous before the Father, holy, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior, and today I bend the knee to you. Father, thank you for your word, and we pray your blessing on this church, on the churches of Melton, in our nation and in the nations. May we live fully for you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in and hope you have a great week and we'll uh, look forward to all that God has for us in the days ahead. Bless you. Our Father everlasting be all created one God Almighty Through your Holy Spirit Conceiving Christ the Son Jesus our Savior I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit Our God is three one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender. Suffered and crucified, forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And I believe in you. Rose again. I believe.